Psalm 73, when my heart was embittered and I was pierced within, then I was senseless and ignorant. I was like a beast before you. Nevertheless, I'm continually with you. You have taken hold of my right hand. With your counsel, you will guide me and afterwards receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but thee? And earth has nothing I desire but thee. My heart and my flesh may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Will you pray with me? <coughs> Father, the truth is, if we will be honest today, sometimes we are ignorant before you. We are like senseless beasts. And any time we forget, Father, that you are our everything, that's a good description. But the psalmist said he came to his senses and that, Lord, he was continually before you and when he came to his senses, he realized that you're his everything. Father, I pray that that would be our hearts today. I pray that as we come here before the day that we would remove all distractions, whatever things that are trying to distract us, to preoccupy our minds. And that we would focus solely on you because, Father, you're our everything. Earth has nothing I desire. And Lord, we have nothing to compare to you. So help us today through the anointing of your spirit to, to give you the honor, the glory, the praise, the obedience, the worship that you rightly deserve. And help us, Father, to not be ignorant. Help us, Lord, to think rightly today through your spirit. And help us to worship you, Father, for the great God that you are. Because, Father, there will soon come a time, regardless of what we do, you will be the only reality that there is. And Lord, you're really the only reality that there is now. So Father, make yourselves real to us today. Help us, Lord, not to worship you in ritual or, or in performance. Help us to worship you out of hearts that are enthralled and occupied with your glory. And we will praise you for it as we lift up the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. 
Well, today is a very special day. Uh, it's a very historic day in the life of the Bel Air Baptist Church family. And you're going to have to wait till the end of the service to see why that is so. But uh, we'll wait till that uh, at the end and we uh, have some special prayer. But we're glad that you're here today. And if you're here today and you're a guest, I don't care if it's your first time, second, third, or fourth time, we just want you to know that we are very, very excited that you're here. But we're always pleased to have guests with us. That We pray for you. We try to prepare for you. And it's always our heart's desire at Bel Air Baptist Church that if you're a, a guest today, that you are encouraged from the moment you step onto our campus till the moment you leave. And we'd like to ask you to do one thing for us, if you would. On the right-hand side of your worship bulletin is a tab which provides a place for you to fill a little information out about yourself because we'd love to have a record of your attendance today. And if you would do that, tear it off, drop it in the offering plate when it comes by a little later, uh, that would be your gift to us, and we would appreciate that. But these guys standing here and also the one in the balcony uh, would like to give you a gift. It's a gift package from the church has a pen if you don't have one so you can fill out that uh, tab at information. So if you're here, if you just slip your hand up in the air, would you do that right quick? Just slip it up where we can see it, balcony or down here either way, and we'll get this in your hands. All right, well, thank you for being here today. Whether you're a guest, whether you're a member, we are glad that you're here, and I'm excited about being in the house of God today. Are you? Amen. I snuck up on you. Excited about being in the house of God today? Praise God. Amen. Are you excited that Alan's back today? Amen. Best I can do, brother. The high-tech nerd. <laughs> I can't say anything and get by with it. I saw that on, the, on YouTube. So. I love to tell the story.
Father and Lord, those who owe a debt can seek forgiveness. And Father, there are so many promises that are made to us, Father. But Lord, there is one, Father, one that no one on this earth can fill, Lord. Father, there's a, a hole in our hearts, Father, and a need in us, Father. Lord, there's a sickness within us, Father. But the only person that can promise that to us is you, Father. And Lord, you freely given this promise to all people who would accept it, Lord. That, Father, we can have forgiveness of our sins, Father. That we don't have to be sick and we don't have to be dead in our transgressions, Father, Lord. We can be whole people free, Father, Lord. The debt has been paid. And, Father, it is available to anyone who would just reach forward and grab it, Lord. Father, by your mercy, we have been forgiven. Lord, I ask that as we come here today, Father, that you would help us to exalt the name of Jesus Christ above all things, Father, Lord. It is truly his name that has been put above everything in every place, Father. Lord, it's at His name that every knee will bow and confess Him, Lord, Father, to Your glory. And, Father, it's Your glory that we're praying for today, Father. And as we go through this week, Lord, we just ask that You would walk with us, Father, and guide us, Father, Lord, that we would be a people of light to those around us, to show them that promise that they can have, Father, in You. And, Lord, it's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Amen.
sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be sing. Thank you, Alan. We joke around and kid a lot, but brother, we are glad you're back. But you are a technological nerd. Glad Tony's back as well. Tony's been over a month of December in Children's Church, attending to the children's ministry, plus been going out of town to see his family for Christmas and glad you're back over in this service brother 
If you haven't already done so, would you turn to 1 John chapter 3? Actually, I think we're going to start reading in chapter 2, verse 28. I think we forget sometimes that uh, while the Bible's the Word of God, uh, chapter headings are not necessarily inspired. They were put in much later by men so that I could tell you to turn the third chapter and the first verse. You knew right where to turn. But actually, John's uh, text, uh, his thought begins in chapter 2, verse 28. And uh, so always be careful. Don't let uh, chapter headings uh, let you miss the context of what the author is saying. Uh, do you like tests? Boy, I tell you, I remember when I was uh, in school, uh, I'd still wake up sometimes with nightmares that I have got a final exam, Tony, in seminary and have forgot about it and hadn't studied for it. Uh, it wasn't unusual to study for 40 hours for one test in seminary. They were that difficult. And, and tests just made you sweat bullet. I enjoyed going to class, but boy, I did not like tests because they held you accountable, didn't, don't they? There's a difference between going to class and, and learning the material, and that's what a test is designed to do. Brendan and I have been watching Are You Smarter Than a Fifth Grader? Y'all ever watch that? Okay, I'm going to stand here right now as your pastor and look you in the eye and say, I am not smarter than a fifth grader. I usually get the first grade, sometimes the second grade questions, and then I have to depend on Brenda after that. But I've noticed something on Are You Smarter Than a Fifth Grader? The people on there that are contestants usually aren't any smarter than I am. And usually by the time they get through the first grade questions and the second grade questions, they've used all the reliance, all the, they call them cheats and copies, of their little fifth grade students that help them. Usually the time they get past the second grade, they're out of any help and they're on their own. But what I've noticed is they come with nothing and they may have $100,000, $150,000. If they'll just quit, they can walk away with it. And now they're on their own, and here's the question. And they sit there and they say, I don't really know the answer. I think I might know the answer. And you know, Jeff Foxworthy tries to get them to walk away, you know, whatever. But they say, well, you know, what, what, you know I didn't have anything when I come. I'm just going to guess at it. Now, now I'll mention all that to mention this. It is amazing the people that are just as flippant about eternity. You ask them the ultimate question, the ultimate test, are you sure that if you died today, are you 100% positive, sure, that you'd go to heaven? That's amazing how flippant, how casual we take that question, we take that test. I mean, you, you've talked to people like that. So I, I think I would go. Uh, well, you know, I, I, I think I'm a pretty good guy or, or I, I think I'll go to heaven. I, but you're not sure? No, I'm not sure, but I, I'm, I'm pretty sure. Well, I tell you what, it's one thing to maybe guess at a question on I'm smarter than a fifth grader and lose $100,000. It's another thing to guess at the question of whether or not you're really saved today and lose your soul in eternity. Amen? Yes. Jesus said, what would it profit someone to gain the whole world? If, if you owned a whole world, if you owned all the gold in Fort Knox uh, or whatever, Jesus said, what would it profit you to lose your soul? I want you to stop, wait just, just for a second. I don't, I'm not just talking to guests. I'm talking to church members as well. It's not been long ago we had a church member get saved. We need to apply this to ourselves very seriously. What would you give if you took that question flippantly and ended up in hell and you knew it will never end? There is no hope. I think the hopelessness may be the worst torment of hell. I don't know. Jesus said, what will you at that moment give in exchange for your soul? You, you would give the whole world. You would give whatever you'd have to give to, to get one moment's relief, let alone to get out. I wonder today, are you smarter than the average person on the street? Are you smart enough to take the test? Are you smart enough to honestly answer 
the question, do you know that you know that you know without any, without any question that you're saved? You say, well, Pastor, that's not possible. Well, you see, that's where you're wrong. Because the Word of God agrees with what I'm telling you. The Word of God very clearly says you can know, you can answer the test, and you can know without any doubt today. If you're smart enough to take the test. If you're smart enough to be honest on the test. The Bible says you can know whether or not you're saved. As we turn our attention to the Word of God today, understand something, that First John was written to a a group of churches that were in crises. They were in crises because they were being infiltrated with a bunch of heretical teachers that taught that God didn't care about how you lived. That God, God doesn't care. They, they were teaching. God doesn't care about how you live. You can claim to be saved. You can claim to be going to heaven. And, and, and you can live this life just like everybody else. God doesn't care what you do with your body. John, on the other hand, writes to these churches in crisis, the book of 1 John, and he writes for an explicit purpose to say that you need to know that you have the assurance of salvation. In fact, he's going to use 33 times in five little short chapters of 1 John, he's going to use 33 times the word we know. It's the Greek word gnosko, that and three and a half bucks to buy you coffee at at Starbucks. But the Greek word gnosko, it means in the Greek that, that you can know something with certainty. That, that there's things that you know beyond a shadow of a doubt. And 33 times John says, I have written these things that you may know that you have eternal life. So how can you know? How can you know? Would you like to know today? I, I'm going to tell you something. I know that I'm going to heaven. I'm not guessing at it. I know. If, if, if I was to die right now, I'm going to face death without fear of hell. Because I took the test. And I've taken it not because it's a test I made up, that it's the test that God has given that I've answered. And I know I'm going to heaven by the grace of God, not anything I've done, by the blood of Jesus Christ. So you say, well, how, how can you know that your life has been transformed? That's the beginning right there, is that Christianity has always been always about transformation. It's always been about a new beginning. It's always been about being something different than you were in the past, a new creature. In fact, remember Jesus in John chapter 3, verse 3, when Nicodemus came to Jesus and said, you know, what am I missing? How? You know, what's the deal here? And Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say unto you, unless a man is born again, you will not see the kingdom of God. Now, now I want you to think for a moment. This was said to a man that was ultra-religious. He was in church every time the church door was open. He taught in the church. He would have had entire books of the Old Testament memorized and committed to memory. Here was a man that came to Jesus who thought being religious was good enough. He thought religion's what it took. And Jesus said, hey, Nicodemus, it doesn't work that way. That's not what it's about at all. You've got to be born again. You've got to have a new start. You've got to be a new creature. In fact, Paul said, that's why Paul said in 1 Corinthians, he's, I mean, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he said, therefore, if any man, notice the test, if. Do you see that if? It's a test. If any man be in Christ, behold, he is a new creature. The old has passed away, and all things have become new. So, back to 1 John, the, the false teachers were, were minimizing the importance of a changed life. They were minimizing the importance of a, a life that's been changed from a sinful lifestyle to a holy lifestyle. They were saying, God doesn't care what you're Doing. Could a, a sermon be any more pertinent than the day and age we live in? Amen? Amen. We're, we're hearing the same things today. You can claim to know Jesus Christ and cohabitate with somebody. 
You can claim to know Jesus Christ and be involved in sexual immorality. God doesn't care. All He just saved you by Jesus Christ. And He doesn't care what you do with your body. Jude talked about such teaching. He talked about these same teachers. Jude said in verse 4 of Jude, and if you ask what chapter, you need to get familiar with Jude. It's only got one chapter. Fourth, fourth verse of Jude says, For certain men whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are godless, who change the grace of our Lord into a license, watch this, who change the grace of the Lord into a license for immorality and deny the Lord Jesus, our only sovereign Lord. You see, there's people, Jude says, that will turn the freedom that we have in Jesus Christ, the freedom that you're saved not by works, that you're saved by grace, by faith, by grace through faith, you're saved by what Jesus did on the cross and nothing else. They take that freedom, they take the grace of God, and they wrongly turn it into a license for immorality. Jude says they turn it into a license for immorality. They they claim to have fellowship with God despite their unrighteous behavior. So let's take the test this morning. You ready? Let's just dive into the Word of God. And let's walk out of here knowing that we know that we, that we know that we're saved. Would you stand with me as we're honored reading the Word of God? We're going to read chapter 2, verse 28 through the 10th verse of chapter 3. The Word of God says, Now little children, abide in Him, so that when He appears we may have confidence and not shrink away from Him in shame at His coming. If you know that He is righteous, you know that everyone also who practices righteousness is born of Him. Chapter 3, verse 1. See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. And such we are. For this reason the world does not know us, because it did not know Him. Beloved, now we are the children of God, and it's not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when He appears we will be like Him, because we will see Him just as He is. And everyone who has this hope fixed on Him purifies himself just as He is pure. Everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. You know that He appeared in order to take away sins, and in Him there is no sin. No one who abides in Him sins. No one who sins has ever seen Him or knows Him. Little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as He is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. And the Son of God appeared for this purpose to destroy the works of the devil. No one who is born of God practices sin. Because his seed abides in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. Would you pray with me? Father, this is a very serious issue today. I always assume that there's people every worship service that do not know you. I always assume there's people on the membership row that do not know you. Father, we may have already had someone get up and walk out. I don't know. But whether we're willing to hear this truth or whether we're not, it doesn't change the truth. Your word is truth. Your word will stand when the world is destroyed, when eternity and the kingdom of Christ is ushered in in its fullness. Your word will still stand. And Jesus said, the word, this very word, will judge you on that day. So Father, help us to be honest with ourselves today. Father, we don't practice, or we don't claim to be your children because we do the right things. We claim to do the right things because we are your children. So 
But Father, help us to make that clear. And Father, I pray right now that your spirit would search out hearts, that you would captivate us. That Father, you would help us not to be moving around today. Help us not to be running in and out of the sanctuary. Help us to be still during the uh, invitation time. Because for someone today, eternity is at stake. And help us to be serious-minded for just a little while. Through the anointing of your Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to talk to you a minute about how you can know with complete certainty whether or not you're saved. Whether or not you have eternal life. You can know with complete certainty that you're saved. This is what John is talking about. John says later in the book of 1 John, he said, these things I've written to you in order that you may know that you have eternal life. That's a good thing to know, isn't it? Y'all with me today? That's a good thing to know. I'd hate to think I'd go in eternity guessing. But so many people do. Hey, I'm a pastor. I deal with death and dying far too often. I hold hands of people when they breathe their last breath. I know of which I speak. A lot of people go into eternity guessing at whether or not they're saved. Because they know a few Bible verses. They, they've gone to church. They, they're in a membership role. They're born to Christian parents. They have kind thoughts towards God. Whatever the background may be, they still don't know with certainty whether or not they're saved. And this is a very serious matter. And we need to get serious about it. And I'm going to ask you today, if you have to go to the restroom, go. We don't want anybody... Not to do what you have to do, but try, try to be still. Give me your attention for 30 minutes, and let's see what God wants to do today. I want you to notice with me, starting in verse 28 through, through verse 2, that John basically says to us, Hey, live like you are. If you're the children of God, you ought to live like the children of God. Did you, did you notice that he said in verse 28 of chapter 2, he said, Now... Little children abide in Him. Him is Jesus so that, watch this, when He appears, that's the second coming of Christ. And brothers and sisters, He's coming. He's coming. One of the days He's going to split the eastern sky and it says all are going to behold Him when He has that name written on His thigh, King of kings and Lord of lords, that even those who pierced Him, even those who denied Him, even those who have cursed Him, they're all going to behold Him and they're going to see Him when He comes. And the Bible says, little children abide in Jesus so that when He appears, that you might have what? Confidence. That you might have confidence confidence that, that you won't be afraid. I, I long to see Jesus, don't you? I can't wait to see Jesus Christ. Oh, how I long to see Him who died for me. I, I just hope God will let me just crawl on my face and kiss those nail-pierced feet. I want to see Jesus. And I want to have confidence when He comes and not shrink back in shame, as John said in verse 28. But notice his logic. He said, you know something. He said, you know that Jesus is righteous. You know that Jesus, verse 29, was sinless son of God. And you also know this, that when he comes back, that everyone also who practices righteousness is born of him. How are you going to have confidence in the day of the Jesus Christ second coming? Only if you've lived for him. Only if He has impacted your life and changed your heart and changed your desires to the point that you desire the things that God desires. Amen? Yes. Now notice verse 1. I, I love it. one of my favorite, verse 1 and 2 of the third chapter of 1 John, one of my favorite passages in the Bible. I want you to just... Read it like you've never seen it before. It says, see, I, I believe the King James, and, and maybe the NIV says, behold. That, that is an imperative Greek uh, word, and, and it's, it's there. It's, a, it's indicating we ought to be amazed. We ought to be dumbfounded. We ought to be awestruck. Behold! How great the love of the Father has bestowed on us. I love the NIV, the way it puts it. He says, Behold what manner of love the Father has lavished on us. 
God doesn't just love us if we're His children. He lavishes His love on us. He pours it out in an overabundance. And that ought to amaze you that you who were formerly a sinner, alienated from God under the wrath of God because of the blood of Jesus Christ when you were saved, that God didn't just save you and erase the board clean and let you start over, but He lavished His love on you and adopted you as the children children of God. And I love the way the NIV puts it. It's as though John wrote that by the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and he laid his quill down and he began to think on what he just had written and he picked his quill up and he said, and behold, that is what we are. That is what we are. Do you realize today as we look at this test of salvation that if you're saved... And that's what we mean by born again. That's what we mean by having eternal life. That's what we mean by that there was a day in your life that you became bankrupt spiritually. You realized you were a sinner. You realized that apart from Jesus Christ, you had nothing. And God convicted you and you fell under the conviction of God as the Holy Spirit drew you to Jesus Christ. And you gave your heart and your life to Jesus, counting on what He did and nothing else. And as you did that, God poured out His Holy Spirit into your heart and God changed your heart supernaturally. He changed your desires. He changed your love. And He gave you the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, which is a seal guaranteeing your adoption as the children of God. That's what we mean when we say saved. We don't mean you walked an aisle. We don't mean you're on a membership roll. We don't mean your parents and mommy and daddy was Christians, that you were born in a Christian home. We don't mean any of that. We mean what God means. That you have given your life to Jesus Christ and He has changed your life. And John says that is what we are. That we've been born again into the kingdom of God. Now notice the logical outpouring here. Notice the last part of verse 1. He says, For this reason, because God has changed you, And because Jesus Christ, even though the world was created by Jesus Christ, John in the Gospel of John chapter 1 said, even though the world was created by Him, the world did not know Him. Do you want to know why Jesus Christ is the only uh, religious uh, person? I know that didn't come out right. Christianity. You want to know why Christianity is the only one that's persecuted by secular media? Do you know why Muslims can blow up the twin tires and then the secular media starts talking about Islam's a a, a religion of peace and promote Islam? Do you want to know why everything's okay except the name of Jesus? Because the world does not know the only true God. And the world hates the only true God. Look what John says in verse 1. He says, For this reason the world does not know Him because it did not know God. Uh, does not know us, excuse me. You know, the world doesn't know you if you're a child of God today. You ever get that deer in the headlight look from people out in the workplace or on the street when you start talking about something spiritual about Jesus Christ? Let's talk about anything other than Jesus Christ. Well, you ought not be surprised. They don't know you because they don't know Him. That this love that God has lavished on us as He adopted us as children of God, it is so foreign to this world. It is such a lavish love. It's a love that the world does not know, cannot understand because it comes from another world. And brothers and sisters, to be rejected by the world, which doesn't know that love of God, that attests to the reality of who we are. Does it not make sense when Jesus said, Woe unto you if the world speaks well of you? Remember that? That's what he's talking about. The world with its decadent lifestyle. You you see, I I don't say things to be hateful. I I really don't. I take no pleasure in talking about the sin of cohabitation because I understand that half the people today that are getting married are living together first. But I love you enough to tell you that's not right. It's it's not that I I take joy out of uh, condemning sin. 
It's that we got to hate what God hates. Amen? And we got to love what God loves. If we're His children, we need to act like God's children. And the world in its decadent lifestyle, it ought to seem strange to us. It ought to seem foreign to us. We are to fill out a place. Listen here. Now listen, I'm not saying you're not saved, but I'm saying that there's a big warning sign in this test. When the only time you think about Jesus is on Sunday morning. When, when you're at home in this world. When what this world has to offer is what you want. When all you care about is a new car or materialism or whatever it might be, we ought to fill out a place in this world because we're in a foreign land as the children of God. That's why the Bible says we're just pilgrims and strangers. We're just passing through. We ought to just think about this life like we're just pitching a tent. I thought about that this morning. And, and you know, when I go on a mission trip to a foreign country, we're going back to Brazil come May. And you know, it's such a rewarding experience. But, but the truth is, while you're in a foreign country, you're not very comfortable. You're out of your comfort zone. Everything's strange. The language is strange. The customs are strange. And you, gotta, you just feel... And then you're so relieved when you finally get back to your real country in Miami where everybody speaks Spanish. And then you get on the plane and you land somewhere north and they speak English and you know you're home. Brothers and sisters, don't you understand that if you're truly saved today, something's wrong with you if you don't feel funny in this world. I tell you, I feel like a cotton-picking dinosaur anymore. Even as an American, I, I feel like I'm not even in America anymore. And the worse the world goes, the more I want to be home. I'm in a foreign country. I'm not comfortable here. I want to go home where everybody speaks the language of God. Notice verse 2. He says, in verse 2, he said, Beloved, now. I want, if you mark in your Bible, circle that word now. Now we are the children of God. Not that we're going to be the children of God. Not that one day we'll be the children of God. Present tense, we are now the children of God. And then he goes on and says, we don't know the full extent of what we're going to be. We just got the down payment, Sister Jackie. We just got the deposit guarantee in our inheritance as the children of God. But he says in verse 2, it's not appeared to us as what we will be, but we go, we, I tell you, this is what we do, Gnosko. This is what we are certain about. We know that when He appears, we're going to be like Him. We're going to have a body like unto the risen body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And He who began a good work in you as a child of God will complete it on that day. Yeah. Amen. Isn't that going to be good? And we don't understand all that. We don't know all the details about that, but there's one thing for sure. Whether you believe in predestination or not, you better believe this. You're predestined, if you're a child of God, to be transformed fully into the image of Jesus Christ. That's your destiny. That's what's going to happen, Paul sa John says. And I'm telling you, there's no exceptions. Look at verse 3. Verse 3, John says, I, I want you to understand there's no exceptions to this. You see, there were false teachers that would tell you that, and there's false teachers today that tell you, you can say all the right things, you can be religious, you can think kindly towards Jesus, you can walk in out, you can just keep on living however you want to live. And John wants you to know in verse 3, there's no exceptions to what I'm telling you. Jesus, in verse 3 he says, and everyone who has this hope, what hope is that? The hope of being fully transformed into the image of Jesus at His second coming. John says anyone who has this hope, everyone. Now you know that's me and you, amen? Uh, that, that's no exceptions. If you think today that you're an exception to the rule, that God's going to make an exception for you, the Word of God doesn't agree with you. Everyone who has this hope does what? Purifies himself. How? Just as Jesus is pure. See, here's the deal. We've got to use the right standard for purification. You talk to people all the time. Are you saved? Do you know Jesus? And you know what they tell you? 
Well, I think I am. I'm not as bad as he is. Oh, let me tell you what them hypocrites down at church do. I, I, I tell you what she did. And you see, the Bible's telling you here, if you're going to take this test today, you've got to use the right standard. You've got to use the right grading curve. That our standard's not other human beings for purification. Our standard's what? The Lord Jesus Christ. And we know that He was perfectly sinless. We know that. And that is our standard. The reason John wrote about the second coming of Christ. Christ, look up here in verse back 28. The reason he wrote about the second coming of Christ is because we would understand that the second coming of Christ determines how we ought to live today. It has practical implications. Look at verse 28. Little children, I'm only talking to the children of God, he says, abide in Jesus. Now, I want you to take your eyes and look down to chapter 3, verse 6. Chapter 3, verse 6, he closes the loop. No one, I like that word, no one, no exceptions. Chapter 2, verse 28, in view of Jesus' second coming, abide in him. Verse 6, chapter 3, no one who abides in him sins. Now, now let me say a word about that, sins. That's different. That is, in the Greek, a continual, ongoing tense. In fact, if you look back in chapter 1, uh, verse 8, John says, if we say we have no sin, we lie, and the truth's not in us. Now, brothers and sisters, I'm not saying we're perfect. I'm not perfect. Trust me, you know that. We blow it. Sometimes we sin singular tense. And we have to go and ask for forgiveness. And we have to clean up our walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why John said in verse 9 of chapter 1, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. We don't profess to be perfect. But over in chapter 3, John's using an ongoing present tense. He is not saying no one ever commits a sin. He says no one lives a lifestyle of sin. No one continues to sin. You see, the second coming of Christ isn't so that we, the Bible talks about it over and over more than anything else. It's not so that we can have little seminars to try to figure out when He's coming. The reason the Bible puts such emphasis on the second coming of Christ is so it would change the way you live today. That you'd be ready and not shrink back at His coming. Jesus talked about that in Matthew. I'm not going to read it all, but Matthew chapter 25, verse 1 through 15. Remember the parable? Jesus said that, that there was, uh, uh, he says the kingdom of heaven is compared to a marriage analogy. He said there was ten virgins, ten bridesmaids, five were foolish, five were wise. And they went, and they went to wait for the bridegroom to come to get them at night. And five wise had oil for their lamps, and the five foolish didn't have any oil. And then when the bridegroom came, that's the Lord Jesus Christ, and He knocked on the door, the five wise trimmed their lamp and came out to meet Him. But the five foolish said, we don't have any oil. And they went to get some oil for their lamp. And while they were gone, the bridegroom left with the bride. And that describes a lot of us today, doesn't it? We don't have the Holy Spirit. We don't have any oil. We, we've not been changed. And Jesus sends that parable. Here's the point of the parable. He says this. He says, Be on the alert then, for you do not know the day nor the hour. So living the life of hope has practical implications. It has practical, it, it, it involves purification. That is the same thing as sanctification. It's the same thing as transformation. It's the same thing as being a new creature. It's the same thing as slowly and surely by this process we call life and sanctification becoming more and more and more like Jesus. I love the way John Newton put it. John Newton's the one that wrote the song Amazing Grace. John Newton used to be a, a slave trader and many, many African Americans met their death down in the hull of his uh, horrific slave ships. 
But John Newton came to meet Christ. He, he got saved. And God changed his heart and he abandoned the slave trade. And, and he had to come to grips with the forgiveness and the guilt that he shared with, with being involved in this, this terrible sin of slave trade. And he wrote the song, Amazing Grace, who saved a wretch like me. And John Newton said this. I love it. This ought to be your testimony today. He said, I'm not what I ought to be. I am not what I want to be. I'm not what I hope to be. But still, by the grace of God, I can honestly say, I'm not what I was. By the grace of God, I am what I am. You see, that, that's how you know. Are you making progress towards purification? Are you judging your life by other people? Or do you have a desire to be like the Lord Jesus Christ now? Notice what he says in verse 4. He goes on to say this. It's very logical. Verse, verse 3, John says it's totally logical. Here's the logic, verse 3. Jesus is pure. See that? Then logically, our hope one day is to be like Him. Then logically, we must begin to purify ourselves now. Jesus is pure. We hope to be like Him. We begin to purify ourselves now. Verse 4, he says again, it's just very logical. And his logic is this in verse 4, that being a child of God is incompatible with the ongoing practice of sin. Look at verse 4. Everyone, again, no exceptions, who practices sin, that's the ongoing present tense. He's talking about this sin characterizes who you are. It characterizes your lifestyle. Notice the word practices, ongoing, routinely. It doesn't bother you. Anyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. Jesus says it's totally incompatible if you're a child of God. Look at verse 5. Here's another logic for you. You say you're united with Jesus Christ, which that's what being saved is. We say that we are a child of God. We say that we have our hope fixed on the thought that one day we're going to be like Jesus. And John says, here's the next logical deduction. Verse 5, you know, you gnosko, you know with certainty that Jesus appeared in order to take away sin. And in him there is no sin. Do you not realize that that's why we had the first Christmas? Do you realize that? That Jesus came, not so we'd have cute manger scenes, but Jesus came for one purpose and one purpose only, to take away the sin of the world. He came to take away sin. He did that by living 33 years as a man, totally sinless and hung on the cross and paid your sin penalty, paid my sin penalty, paid our debt, took the wrath of God that was due me, he took it on himself, and he did that not only to take away the sin of the world, but to take away my sin. It's personal. And no one who knows that continues to sin. You can't just go on sinning realizing that you love the Lord Jesus Christ and it's your very sin that nailed Him to the cross. It's what put Him there. And every time you sin and you claim to be in Christ, it's like you drive a nail in His hand again. It's like you stick the sword in His side. Notice in verse 6, another deduction. No one who abides in Jesus, no one who lives in Jesus, no one who's united with Jesus sins, ongoing, present tense sins. No one who's seen, here's the test. You can answer false. It don't matter. John grades the test, the Word of God grades the test, and it says no one who sins has seen Him or knows Him. How does that describe you today? You see, you can fool me. That's not hard at all. But you can't fool God. God knows your heart. He knows what you think. And sin, practicing sin, takes on many 
different forms. It might be sexual immorality, cohabitation, having sex with someone you're not married with, even as a teenager or college age or even as an adult. It might be sexual immorality in a form of pornography and you enjoy it and you do it ongoing and it doesn't convict you, it doesn't bother you. John says that's a good test question to answer because if that describes you, not me, the Word of God says you don't know Jesus or you couldn't do that. It would bother you. God would bring you as His child to repentance. Notice that John says, verse 7 and 8, don't let anybody deceive you. You might walk out of here today and go to talk to some other religious person that would tell you different. John says, don't let anyone deceive you. Little children, verse 7, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he, Jesus, is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. It's very logical. It's not complicated. If we don't know that we're saved today, it's because we just don't want to take the test. We don't want to look in our hearts and tell ourselves the truth about ourselves. The Bible says very logically, verse, verse 6, well, you, you do the right thing. You practice righteousness not in order to be saved, but because you're saved. Because you've been adopted, because your heart's been changed. In verse 8, he says, you do what's wrong because you're of the devil. You're walking under the influence, the power of this world, this act of the air of Satan. Remember what Jesus told the religious Pharisees? He said in John chapter 8, verse 44, he told the religious people, he said, you belong to your father, the devil. And you do what your Father wants you to do. You know, actions really do speak louder than words, don't they? They really do speak louder than words. We can say all the right things, but John reminds us in verse 10. He says in verse 10, By this the children of God and the children of the devil are what? Obvious. Obvious. The NIV puts it this way very clearly. The NIV says, this is how we know. Do you want to know if you're saved today? This is how we know who the children of God are and who are the children of the devil. You see, the absence of a righteous character, not that you're perfect, but the absence of a heart that loves God and desires to be holy and desires to please God and desires to obey God, the absence of a heart like that reveals that you're still of your father, the devil, because if you were of your father, God, you'd have a heart like that. John says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 3, he says, we know that we have come to know Him if we obey His commands. The man who says, I know Him, I know Jesus, but does not do what He commands is a liar. And the truth is not any. But if anyone obeys His word, God's love is made complete in him. This is how we know we are in Him. Whoever claims to live in Him must walk as Jesus did. Not might, must. Let me ask you as we try to make sense and answer the question, what do we do with this? Are you at home in this world? Are you at home in this world? Does the things that anger God anger you to the point that you yourself don't participate in them? Second Timothy talking about the end times. And let me tell you folks, we're in the end times. It's time we get serious. It's time we quit living in this world as the people of God and become serious about the world that's coming. We're in the end times. And and Paul says to young Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, he said, but mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. If you don't know we're not in the last days, you've not been paying attention to the news. There are going to be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, Boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, 
without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasures rather than lovers of God. Now watch this. Having a form of godliness, but denying its power. Have nothing to do with them. I, I submit to you that we're seeing this prophecy fulfilled right now in our day. That people today have a form of godliness and they deny its power. You say, well, preacher, what does that look like? What does it look like to have a form of godliness and deny its power? It's what John's talking about. You say you know Jesus, but you say Jesus has no power to change your life. You don't know Jesus. Because let me tell you something. I tried religion and it did me no good. But when I met Jesus, that's what I needed. When I got up, my heart was changed. I've not been perfect. But I tell you, for 35 years, Jesus and I got a thing going on. And I'm not what I used to be. You know, George Barna did a survey not long ago, and it started to make us weep. A few years ago, and I guarantee you it's only gotten worse, George Barna did a survey update, and he said this. Now, first of all, a worldview. A worldview is how you think. And everybody here has got a worldview, you just don't know it. You've got some logical thing in your mind. It's like eyeglasses. It's how you, the lenses you look and view the world. That's a worldview. When you see the news, it's, it's the thought process of you analyze that and you try to make sense out of it. And George Barna did a survey and said that only 4% of Americans have a biblical worldview. Four, not 44, four. Does that, that tell you where, where we're at as a nation? In other words, few people demonstrate love and obedience and the power of Christ in their life. Few people act like Jesus because they don't even know how Jesus thinks. And then you think, well, that, that, that's the country at large, preacher. You don't understand. There's all kinds of people in the church that have a biblical worldview. I wish that was so. Because that same survey showed that only 9% of people who claim to be born again have a biblical worldview. All of the preachers, that's, that's all denominations, Catholic, uh, mainline. Only 8% of Baptists have a biblical worldview. You see, we're living in the age where we have a form of godliness, but we're denying its power. Increasingly, we rely on our feelings and emotions rather than the Word of God to be the way that we view our lives and view the world. And I'm going to tell you something, folks. Emotions and feelings have about a first-grade education. They are no good because they're falling just like the rest of you are falling. You know, we're that crazy. We are an obese people. We're an obese nation. We're obese spiritually as well. Have you ever noticed on the commercials that there is no low that marketeers won't stoop to to sell you a diet pill? For example, hydroxycut. Remember that one? They, they had a commercial, Maria Duncan come on there and claimed she lost 35 pounds, and it was so easy, she didn't have to change the way she ate. She didn't have to exercise. All she had to do was take a pill every day, hydroxycut. And they had a before picture and an after picture. The only problem is, came to light that her before picture, she was pregnant, and her after picture, she had given birth. Let me tell you, don't underestimate how low marketeers will go to sell you a magic pill. Uh, for example, Xenodrin, another diet pill. They paid a competitive bodybuilder, Mike Passino, to pig out, to stop working out, to stick out his stomach, wear baggy pants, and frown for his before picture. And then they paid him to apply his bodybuilding expertise. They paid him to work out two times a day, four hours a day each time and diet to lose the weight and then he got on and did the commercial I didn't have to do anything but take this pill never underestimate how low some marketeers will go to sell you a magic pill if it's too good to be true 
It's, it is. It's too good to be true. I want you to listen to me. And I don't want anybody moving around. Please. This is serious time. We're going to respond to the Word of God. You better never underestimate how low Satan will go to sell you the magic pill of false salvation. It's not believing in your head that Jesus is the Christ. It's not knowing a few Bible verses. It's not being on a membership row. It's not any of those things. Have you ever come to the time when you realized you were hopelessly lost without Jesus and God convicted you so and drew you to Christ that you turned from a lifestyle of sin and gave your heart and life to Jesus, which meant you made Him Lord of your life, not that you'd be perfect, but that the best you know how you'll live for Him. That's what salvation is. It's not what we do. It's not that you, you did anything that earned it. It's because you did do it, and Christ came into your heart and adopted you as a child of God. He changed your heart. And therefore, you started desiring the things of God. That's the question. That's the test. Alan's going to come. And we're going to give you a time to respond. This would be the time. These people here right now, God's convicting you. You see, we want to start the new year out right. We started it out trying to be right parents. And last week we tried to start it out by being the right kind of church, the one that has a great love for Jesus Christ. But we want to start it out right knowing that we know that we know that we're saved. We're going to give you an opportunity to come. Walking this aisle won't save you. But I tell you what, it'll sure help drive the stake in the ground and it'll help settle things. Uh, Tony's up here, Brother Bill's up here. We'll take you out back. We'll pray with you. We won't embarrass you. We're going to ask you to come. Would you bow your head? I want to pray for you. If, you, if God's been dealing with you about joining the church, we're going to ask you to, to come to do that too. Father, we thank you for this very serious time. And I pray right now that you would do only that which you can do. Lord, for those that hearts are beating fast or like it's up in their throat, let them know, Lord, that that's you drawing them, convicting them, and that's a good thing. And Father, give them the faith to step out and to take hold of Jesus and the newness of life. And we'll praise you in Jesus' name for his glory. Would you stand?